ladies and gentlemen, I hope you're doing well today. It's Tech Tuesday on a Wednesday. But anyway, it's Tech Tuesday, and we're actually starting out today with our version of Shark Week, or we call it Colloidal Silica Week. And during this week, we are going to totally focus on colloidal silica, defining it, using it, looking at it. Oh, I forgot to get our samples. Ready? Magic. So today is the start of Colloidal Silica Week, where we're going to go into a lot of information and how-tos when using colloidal silica, because we want you to understand what this new technology can do for concrete, and of course the how-to. But today, day one, is all about defining what colloidal silica is, and we've got three different types of colloidal silica. So you got the, uh, the definition of colloidal silica week. Let me go into a little bit of history. I just spoke to a wonderful lady the other day that was telling me that some of the research that she's dove into for colloidal silica goes back into its manufacturing back in the 1800s. But from what I know, the first documented patent on colloidal silica was back in 1959. I credit the adoption of colloidal silica into cement composites by Brian Green at the Army Corps, and I believe that started back in 99, 2000 time frame. As it turns out, folks in New Zealand at Markham started using colloidal silica based uh, hydrogel technology back in 1996. So there's a lot of history to this awesome technology. Um, and let's, let's talk about what it is. And when you look at it, colloidal silica is uh, a, a nanosilica particle uh, universally dispersed in a, a liquid dispersion. So uh, a colloid means, uh, like milk is a colloid, uh, where it's a universal dispersion of fats within a fluid, and that's what milk is. With colloidal silica, it's a universal, universal dispersion of nanosilica particles, um, and you know we take advantage of those in concrete. Now that dispersion, I've got three in front of me, can depend solid content anywhere from 15 to 70 percent uh, solids. Um, the particle size can be anywhere from 1 to 100 nanometers as it fits into that definition of a nanoparticle. Uh, the specific gravity can be anywhere between 1.1 1 .1, 1 1.4 and it could be clear all the way through to a milky appearance, as well as somewhere in between, somewhere like a, a skim milk. And um, the, the change in color is based on the side and the size and the inclusion of particles. So this clear water-like uh, dispersion would be more of a, a narrow distribution of very small particles or a wide distribution of even smaller particles. Um, the, 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 the more translucent we get, or more opaque we get, for that matter, the larger the particle or the, and or the larger the variation of particle sizes. So this will be somewhere, uh, this was around 3 nanometers, this is somewhere around 10 nanometers, and this dispersion is around somewhere around 40 nanometers. Um, and when we look at a, a dispersion, um, there are different types, and I think I've already covered them, so these three figures over here are supposed to represent the different types of dispersions that we have. And the first one that we have is a poly dispersion, a dispersion that has a, a wide range of particle sizes. When I say wide range, you can have a, a mean particle size of a you know, certain amount, let's say 50 nanometers or 30 nanometers, but a particle size distribution, a very wide range from 3 to 100 nanometers. Uh, the second type is a, a narrowly distributed or mono dispersion and that's a very hard thing to do so I don't want to say mono dispersion but that's what we're trying to achieve here where instead of having uh, 3 to 100 nanometers in our particle size distribution you have more like 3 to 5 or 45 to 47 or 10 to 15 that very narrow distribution of sizes and then the last piece of it is we can change up not only the type of particle that we're playing with, so the shape of it, the geometry, but also what's on the coating or on the surface of that nanoparticle. And bear in mind when nanosilica particles are made and colloidal silica suspensions are made, we're taking some type of fluid, uh, something that has normally a metallic based salt or a mineral with a salt in it, but there's, there's some type of salt with the silica and we rip and strip that salt off 
and that monomer of, of silica wants to grow onto something else. And that's ultimately what happens is, is that silica starts rolling up on itself until it becomes a nice sphere. Um, and what we do is we start throwing some sodium oxide at it or sodium hydroxide uh, or other things at it to stop that growing process. And, you know, a, a lot of people ask me how hard is it to make colloidal silica, and it's not hard. I mean, I've known people who've done it in a garage, you know, with, with few, and not that working in a garage is a bad thing, but to make a quality product, it's, it's a very hard thing to do. Easy to make colloidal silica in a garage, hard to make a, a, a very poor quality product, but very difficult to make a different types of dispersions, and then of course, the ultimate thing to do is the different coatings on those surfaces, you know, whether it's some type of inorganic or some type of mineral or some type of metal that's being uh, putting some type of layer on here that's going to either control the reactive potential of that colloidal silica or bring other some bring bring some other feature and benefit to the table. So um, you know, that's that's the first thing that I wanted to go over. You know, is really define what a colloidal silica particle is that spherical, traditionally nanoparticle, in solution an amorphous uh, or ultrafine amorphous colloidal silica, as Brian says in his paper, and we'll put that link below, uh, so that polydispersion, the monodispersion, and then, you know, with these two, you can change up the coatings, and then you can mix and match them too. So really like boutique style colloidal silicas. Uh, and how are they used? Um, the first use of colloidal silica in concrete that I know is as a viscosity modifying agent, which it works beautifully, inexpensive, uh, compared to other viscosity modifying agents, and it doesn't have as negative of an impact on the fresh and hard properties, specifically the permeability of the concrete or the grab compared to other types of VMAs. Um, and, and then the other thing is for densification purposes. Uh, when it comes to these different coatings, you can do anything from permeability, uh, reduction to resistance to physical chemical attack or making your concrete more hydrophobic or resistant to the migration of other deleterious materials. So there are, are different ways of using these colloidal silicas throughout the construction industry and the focus of this week is going to be showing you some of those ways and one of the ways that we're going to start off with is using colloidal silica as a viscosity modifying agent. So that's the next step, is we're going to go over the mix design, uh, how we use it, put it into the concrete, and show you some uh, slumps and some spreads with and without that colloidal silica as a VMA, especially when segregation is just around the corner. So I'm pretty excited. If you have any questions, any comments, I was supposed to tell you to like and subscribe earlier on. Don't forget to do that. Have a great one. Go concrete. Meet us all. Start spreading the news.